Well, I wanted to, I was asked to share some thoughts on why we uh, wanted to dedicate this building to Joan of Arc. And I have to uh, say a special thank you to Rob Monterelli and, and we met about six or eight times and talked about this project and, and he probably at this point thinks I'm uh, a little certifiable. <laughs> but I, uh, in a nutshell, the reason that uh, Joan of Arc is that uh, one, she's a teenage saint. Two, she's the epitome of strong faith-based leadership and the epitome of looking for uh, objective truth and speaking that truth uh, courageously, no matter what the uh, ultimate outcome. We're living in a time, uh, I believe, and I think a lot of people uh, see that uh, strong faith-based leadership is necessary, and our thought is why not uh, Bellman and why not the students at Bellman. I want to say a special thank you to uh, the Jesuits here because uh, before doing this we met with Father uh, Fuchs and Father Fred and talked about this, and, uh, and I'll say two things. Number one is that uh, uh, it seemed a little bit odd at first in a Jesuit school to be talking about naming one of the buildings after a non-Jesuit saint, and, and uh, it was a little bit out of the ordinary. Secondly, it is so Jesuit, and that's one of the things I think that we discovered in, in talking to people. It is so uh, uh, you know, open-minded, and, and uh, uh, it's, it's really, I think, a, a beautiful, inclusive thing. For those of you, and I, I should talk about it, and you know, I'll speak a little bit from the heart right now because uh, I've had a, a lifelong devotion to Joan of Arc, and, and that's part of the reason uh, for this. Somewhere down at Stanford or Hastings, I started getting excited about Joan of Arc and, and uh, her biography and, and uh, what she had done in the two years of, of her uh, being in command, essentially, of the French armies. And, that's something that uh, we'd like to share with people because uh, I do believe, and we've got a, um, uh, a handout that uh, I hope we're gonna, we're gonna put at the tables when people leave. And I hope there, there's not only uh, this handout uh, that talks a little bit about Joan of Arc, and it's, it's, uh, it's interesting because it's got people such as, you know, quotes from Winston Churchill, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, uh, uh, Mark Twain and, and so forth, and really a, a variety of uh, uh, reflections on Joan of Arc, and then there's also an essay by uh, uh, Mark Twain that I hope everybody uh, takes a moment to read, and then I think Dean put some information from Pope Benedict, too, on, on Joan of Arc. Briefly, and I know a lot of people uh, know the biography, but Joan of Arc, uh, uh, born to a family of five children, extremely poor in Domremy, France. She was born at a time when the Hundred Year War was going on in France. Uh, France was split up, broken, demoralized. The army was uh, essentially done, and uh, uh, it looked the king was uh, in exile, uh, King Charles VII, and it looked like uh, things were over for France, and this year, and this war was never going to end, and, and so forth. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, this young woman who started hearing voices at the age of 13, steps forward at the age of 16, goes into the uh, uh, local uh, uh, official and tells her that she needs, tells him that she needs to see the king because uh, God has asked her to uh, bring back the crown to France and lead all the king's armies. Well, it, uh, you know, then they looked at her and said, well, uh, how did God talk to you? And she goes, well, through St. Michael, St. Margaret, and St. Catherine. And the impressive thing about Joan of Arc is that somehow, and I had, I wanted actually, uh, uh, and we, we had a couple students that were gonna come in just to, to give the idea on, you know, for everybody here, we know what our sophomores here uh, look like. We know what our juniors look like. That's the age Joan of Arc was. And somehow through her force of personality, she went in and, and convinced the king that she should uh, head up the armies of France. She's the only person in the history of uh, 
uh, really humanity that at age 17 has headed the uh, armies of a major uh, nation. Her first uh, order to the troops, and imagine this uh, uh, 16, 17-year-old girl then walking up to the troops, looking at them and saying, uh, one, I'm in charge, and two, uh, our first two orders are number one, go to confession, number two, go to mass. And they sent her up by uh, this sort of a test up to uh, Orleans where uh, there had been a five month siege of the city of, of Orleans. And then uh, she predicted it and nine days later the French were victorious and, and uh, uh, ended that siege. She then went on to a string of victories that were sort of uh, never seen and, and uh, 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 just amazing uh, you know, battle victories and, and uh, regaining cities for the French and, and restoring the, uh, the pride uh, uh, in the um, uh, army. And the French actually wound up uh, taking over. She went to Reims and, and uh, crowned uh, King Charles VII, the uh, uh, King of France, uh, and uh, ended the Hundred Year War. So, our thought, and then at, I think everyone knows at that point she's captured by the uh, 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 French, the Burgundians, and given to the English, and the English uh, uh, give her to Bishop Pierre Cachon. Pierre Cachon and uh, uh, the Catholic Church then uh, uh, had a uh, ecclesiastical court. She was convicted of heresy and, and burned at the stake. Uh, for those parents in here, uh, 25 years later, due to her mom's efforts, uh, she was, uh, the ecclesiastical court was overturned and she was ultimately uh, declared a, a martyr and a saint. If, if you get a chance, the materials that we've given uh, that are out there, uh, take a look through them. One of the things that uh, I included, in, I, uh, I love this book. And we, down at our office, we've got a big picture of Joan of Arc in the entryway if you ever get down there and, and uh, uh, we give this book out to anyone that asks for it. Uh, actually, it's a book by Mark Twain. Mark Twain thought it was the best book he had ever written. You never hear about it. You hear about Huckleberry Finn and you know, Connecticut Yankee and so forth, but Tom Sawyer. But uh, it's a beautiful book, particularly in light of the fact that he was so bitter towards uh, organized religion. And uh, his conclusion at the end of it is uh, uh, incredibly impressive that Joan of Arc was one of the uh, uh, if not the uh, most impressive people that mankind has produced. So, all of that is to say that um, uh, because of this devotion and so forth, uh, and because of the, uh, the desire, when, when Rob Monterelli came to, came to our house one night and talked about the fact that uh, at Bellarmine, one of the things he'd like to do is, is uh, really work on the leadership aspect of the students here in, in making sure that the development is producing strong leaders. So our hope in naming this uh, after Joan of Arc is that uh, it would inspire students to uh, uh, emulate Joan of Arc's spirit, uh, to emulate that courageous leadership based on faith, based on learning and following God's will. And those of you that know Joan of Arc know that that was foremost all the time. She talked about following God's will. And I think that so, fits so nicely with Ignatian uh, spirituality, and particularly that portion that talks about finding God's will for us and then following it. And uh, finally, being courageous about uh, the faith. One of the things that's striking about Joan of Arc is how uncompromising she was, how courageous she was. Uh, never apologetic, and as I stated later, uh, I think we're living in a time and place where that's uh, greatly needed, and uh, we need more Joan of Arcs uh, uh, in this country, and, and why shouldn't they come from Bellarmine? So, thank you.
is so much bigger than a building. This space, I feel, is going to represent Bellarmine in the whole vision of what our mission is. Bellarmine has a commitment to excellence, and we do that. We do that academically. We do that athletically. We do that with our arts. We, we do that with our music. Did anyone hear the choir this morning at Mass? Okay, I really think we need to do a CD. <laughs> and it needs to help fund this building. Um, we do it beautifully. Well, now is the moment for this building to reflect our commitment to excellence. This building has, has been spoken to beautifully already. This is a home away from home for every student. It's, um, this is where it's going to be the kitchen table of Bellarmine. This is where students and faculty and parents and alumni um, are gonna come and sit across from each other and look each other in the eye. And there's gonna be laughter, there's going to be tears, there's, there's going to be discussion, there's going to be healing. This is the center of the home of Bellman. Um, the other thing that we totally embrace at Bellman is a commitment to um, helping develop people to be people for others. And this is a very exciting thing about what this space is going to do. Because it's not just for the Bellarmine family. I mean, it is. It's going to be wonderful here for the, every student, for the whole Bellarmine family. But it also helps Bellarmine kind of open its arms a little broader to the parishes to the entire community out there um, to say, welcome, come on up, because we are a light on the hill. We are. And now I think we can even more easily share that light. We can have leadership conferences up here for all of Tacoma. We can host speakers and retreats, and um, this creates that space. So, um, I think the bottom line is, this is the moment, Mark, you said it so beautifully in a quote that um, this is the right building at the right time. And it's very exciting to be part of it, and we're just, I just use the word way too often, we're very excited <laughs> for everyone to be a part of this, because this is Bellarmine's building, and it's everyone's building. 